Okay, that's everyone. Um, so I'm going to do a little motion uh, workshop here, and then we'll tackle the lecture. I put a turbulent noise on this cat's eye and a little bit of a specular highlight in the pupil. And I just want to remind you that you can non-uniformly scale your textures to get more unique shapes and uh, help yourself out better. And you could also reposition them as well. So I just did that to dress up the eye a little bit better so it's not so flat looking. And I don't know why there's, oh, it's because of my gradient fill that there's a little bit of white around that. But okay, so here is what the takeaway is from this example. I drew the pupil because I am planning on animating the shape path. Remember, you cannot animate a shape path for a normal shape. You've got to use the pen and actually draw it. So I'm going to have the pupil look over to the left, get to the center, and then look over to the right. So we've got our motion planned out. And I can use my sliders. And this is my resting position or my center right there. And now I just go in the opposite direction. And I need it to return back to the center. So I'm going to paste that keyframe that I had. Let me zoom out a little bit, change my render area, select all of these, and right click keyframe, easy ease. Now let's check out our motion real quick. Okay, any questions on that so far? Okay, now you're going, well, why are we doing this little exercise? I'm showing you the basics and then trying to push everybody little by little to get from beginner to intermediate and start trying a little bit more advanced stuff. So here's where we go past beginner. We've got a keyframe on the shape path, which we added and we can edit the shape. And we can start thinking about this to fake depth and dimensionality by editing that shape. Now it looks more like it's going off of a curved surface because I changed the shape of the path. And it's gonna animate back to, you know what? I've gotta copy this point paste it. That's my resting middle. Now when I get over here, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to cheat that dimensionality like such. And then when I get here, paste back my good resting frame. Now let's take a look at that motion. It's subtle, but do you see the difference? I can actually drag all these a little bit further away. If I hold down Alt, I'm spraying them out evenly. I'll just slide that a little bit further apart. Now let's take a look at it. It looks like the shape of the pupil is changing as it rotates. And I'll ease those as well. I can even make it look more extreme so it's more obvious. Exaggeration is one of the 12 principles of animation as well. We haven't talked about that one too much. Now the exaggeration really helps. And a reminder, always make sure you're over a keyframe when you go to make your changes or else you're going to add a new keyframe, which we do not want. Now let's take a look at it with the exaggeration. Now it's a little bit more obvious because the motion hides some of the subtlety. Any questions on any of that? Okay. Um, I'm going to duplicate this eye shape. 
put it over top of my pupil and use it as an alpha mat so that the pupil never really leaves the shape of the eyeball. So my mat is on top. Remember, you put a Halloween mask over your face. So here's what's going to reveal. Here's my switches, toggle switches and modes. These are my modes. This is what's going to be revealed. So under track mat, I choose alpha mat. And now the pupil will never leave the shape of the eyeball as it's turning. Like such. And I added a little bit of texture, a little bit of a specular highlight because that's what eyes do. They catch the light. I can even add some specular highlight on the lens or whatever it's called back here. And I can even make this a blending mode on top of the blending mode I used for the uh, noise inside of it. And see how we're already getting a radically different look just by messing around with our blending modes. It's actually pretty interesting. And I could always adjust the opacity of that to bring back a little bit of the eye beneath it if I wanted to. And then recolor the one below it to match that color a little bit more. So if I'm here, why is it not showing me the color? Oh, here it is. It's a fill. That's right. So if instead of going from dark, it goes to... See, now we're matching it up more. There we go. That's just pushing your work a bit. It's a lot, more, lot different from what we had with just boring flat shapes and plus changing the color of my gradient, got rid of that white line around it. And I could even, if I wanted to, add like a fake hair texture behind this to make it look like it's on um, fur. So let's do a solid. And then after this, we're going to do character rigging with more advanced shape uh, diving into the shape layer is far more complex. So I'm just experimenting with this. Seeing what I could do by changing the scaling. And since it's, I'm going for a hair look, I'm going to spread it out so that it's more stretched like that. Make it a little thinner. And if I scale it down to add a little bit more of it. See how now I have more of a uh, dry brush, like hatched look almost. I can just adjust it some more until I get the look I want. And I think that really added a lot more pop. So I think that extra minute of just experimenting really helped. Do you see how tone and texture and highlights really push your art just from flat, boring graphic shapes? I could also, if I wanted to push this, throw rough edges on it. Just to give it a little bit more character. And remember, if I can click here, it'll hide the path. And additionally, as this animates, it'll have more texture to it as well. Give it a little bit more of a hand-drawn look. Like that. Add some more interest. I could even copy and paste this to the eye as well.
like that. All right. So I'm just trying to get you thinking beyond flat, boring shapes, as well as faking a little bit of perspective and depth by animating your shape paths a little bit, just for that little bit of subtlety, using noise and texture to help push your art. I'm going to email this out to the class so you have it for reference. We're going to start diving into creating a character with shape layers and getting more complex with the parameters of shape layers as well. I'm going to do a recap about shape layers and animating them. Okay, so if I go point, 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 three points, this is one type of arm. It's got hard edges. So if we animated the shape path to it, it end up looking like this. That keeps giving me that transform I don't want. There we go. So let's check out that motion. Okay, that's a rough arm motion. Shoulder, elbow, wrist. Does everybody have that down? Okay. I'll call this one with bones. The fact that there's no Bezier curves makes this look more like the way the arm moves because the arm does not bend between the wrist and the elbow and it does not bend between the elbow and the shoulder. It bends at the joins. That's the way it's designed to work. Okay. So that's what it would look like having bones. Now I'm going to do the next one with curves. Same idea. You know, shoulder, elbow, wrist. And if I go back down to my contents and my path, I can now go here. And I can animate my Bezier curve handles as well as my path points, which is an option I did not have available with just the rigid straight lines. So let's review the two different looks. Both of them are arms. Both of them have their joins. This is a more noodly type of motion than that. As long as you make your choices look deliberate, that's fine. But if it make it look like you don't know what you're doing, people will be like, why that person make those choices? You'll see noodly motion like this in a lot of Cartoon Network things like Adventure Time, where they have rubbery type of limbs just for more expressive motion. It's really based upon what you, the motion designer, want as your motion. We're on our third option. I'm going to hide these. Well, actually, I'll just get rid of them. Oops, nope. Where did they go? Oh, I zoomed in too much. Okay. Here's our third choice. Let me move this one over a little bit. I'll move this one over. I'm going to do three lines again. And this time, I'm going to click on the word path and I'm going to go window, create nulls from paths. And I'm going to do points follow nulls. And I'm going to close that by clicking the X. So now I've got a null where each point was, okay? 
I'm going to name these. This is the wrist. This is the elbow. I'm hitting enter to name them. And that's the shoulder. Okay. So if I move my wrist, the path point follows it. Okay. This is the third way of doing your nulls. I mean, of doing your motion. So now let's try and parent this. If I parent the elbow, I mean the wrist to the elbow and the elbow to the shoulder, what's going to happen now, if I move my shoulder, they're all going to move together like a normal arm would. Since these are nulls, if I rotate them, now I can rotate the arm as well as have some control over here with that extra point. So let's try the middle one. See, now it's bending like an elbow and I'm still keeping the volume of my shape and everything's parented together. This is a more professional, complex way of animating a limb. There's one more advantage to it. I'm going to hit U to hide my keyframes. Hide those as well. All right, so I'm going to quickly draw this out so I don't waste everyone's time. I'm going to make a Mickey Mouse hand like that, and I'll give it a fill. Perfect. Now, watch this. I'm going to name it hand. I'm going to parent the hand. Let me get my selection arrow. I'll parent the hand to the wrist. Okay, now watch this. If I rotate the wrist null, now the hand rotates with it. Let me put this down below here. Additionally, if I rotate my shoulder, now the hand moves with it because it's parented to the wrist. This is a far more complex rig and gives me plenty more animation options and keeps the volume. Any questions on that? And since we're at lab, I'm going to call this one um, Pro Rig. Let's try this. I'm going to, I've already added my nulls. I'm going to see if I can change the look of this real quick after I've already set it up. And I'm going to do that by going to my stroke options inside it. And I'm going to give it round cap and a round join. See, now I've got a soft curve going in there and a soft curve going up there. So I can edit my joins and my caps while still keeping the rig working. Let's double check. Make sure, yep, all the parenting's still there. All right, now we're going to get into the serious stuff. Let me rename this arms so it makes sense. Okay, so let me fit this to window. I'm going to, let's see, what color am I going to make my character? I'll make my character light green. Eh, no, let's do blue. No, you know what? Purple. There we go. Our character will be purple. I'm going to hold down, well, I'll do about, let's say an oval shaped head, okay? And whenever you're doing a character, hit enter to name your layers. You've got to name them. It's crucial. I'm going to set my anchor point now at this point. And of course, the anchor point is going to go at the bottom because that's where the head rotates from the neck. All right, now I'm going to do a rounded rectangle for the torso. Let's say the torso is about that big. Sure, why not? I'll name it torso. Now, I'm going to go to 
my rectangle path. And I'm going to make this an even 200 wide. Just for simple, you know, math here coming up. I'm going to put the anchor point at the bottom middle because that's where it meets the hips. And I'll change the color of the torso just so we know what we're doing here. Um, let's pretend it's a shirt. Uh, our character will be wearing a blue shirt. Sure, why not? All right. Now, I know this is 200 wide. So I'm going to add some hips in that are a circle. You can do any shape you want, but the hips, I'm just making a circle for this. Now I'm going to my path, 200 wide. Line it up roughly. And I'm going to set my anchor point to the middle of the hips. Now I can select all these layers and use my align, just like an illustrator. And... There we go, that's the one I want right here. Align horizontally. So now they're all aligned horizontally. All right, and I'm going to scale them all down a little bit because there's no room for the legs. So now I can get these, move them up. Fine. I'm going to put the head on top, the hips below the torso, and I'll keep them the same color as the torso. All right. I'm going to parent my head to the torso and I'm going to parent the hips to the torso. The torso will be driving this full character. All right. Now we've got arms and legs and the way I'm going to rig this, the arms and legs will be built in a similar fashion. So if this was going to be like an eight limbed spider, it'd work the same way. I'm going to do noodle arms. I'm going to use Bezier curves to really show the power of this technique I'm about to do. So I'm going to do a stroke with no fill and a solid fill. I mean, no fill and a solid stroke. All right, so I'm going to click once for my shoulder, click and drag. I mean, click and drag for my elbow and click and drag for my wrist. And I'll make this a bit larger. And then I'm going to move the anchor point holding down control or command so it snaps up here at the shoulder. I'll call this arm left or you could go left arm, but this way I know it's for the left side of the body. I'm going to twirl down, go to my contents, go to my shape, go to my path, keep that open, go to my stroke. I'm going to do round cap, round join for a cartoony look. And I'm going to call this first layer that I created inside the arm. I'm going to hit enter to name it. And I'll call it skin. So since this is skin and I already said my character is purple, I'm making it purple using the eyedropper. Any questions on that part so far? Okay, I'm going to keep moving forward. This part is severely important. So if you don't get it, let me know right away. And then I'll explain it again. For the arm, inside the contents, I've got the skin. I'm going to click the path stopwatch to create a keyframe. This is going to be used to drive an expression we're going to do for the arm. So I'm going to duplicate the skin inside the arm contents by selecting the skin, control D to duplicate, hit enter and name it, and I'm going to name it sleeve. And I can get rid of this keyframe right here. And I'm going to change the color of the sleeve to the shirt that he's wearing. And I'm going to shorten it by with the sleeve selected. I'm going to add a trim path. Trim paths don't always have to be animated. 
and you can use them to shorten your shape layers. You can already see when I animate the end, when well I animate change it, I can make it a long sleeve, I can make it a three quarter sleeve, or I can make it a short sleeve. I'm going to do a three quarter sleeve. And the end of the sleeve would not look like that. It would be around, I mean, a butt cap and a miter join. We'll fix that shoulder in a second. Now, I'm going to use an expression here so that the sleeve moves with the arm. I'm going to hold down Alt or Option while I click on the path for the sleeve, the pick whip that's in the expression field, not the one for the layer, the one in the expression field is what we'll be using. Just like with some of the other expressions we've done in this class. So here's my skin, here's the path, here's my sleeve, and the expression we just added to the sleeve. I'm going to pick whip from the sleeve path to the word path for skin. Now remember, if you've got the text cursor, you're still in your expression field. If you get the white arrow, that means you're out of your expression field. And you can click to end your expression. So let's take a look at what we just did. Here's my sleeve where we have the path keyframe that we added an expression. I mean the skin. The skin has the keyframe. The sleeve has the expression. So if we animate our skin path now, I'm going to add a new keyframe. And I've got my selection arrow and I'm going to oops, click here. I'm going to move the arm a little bit. I'll use the noodle style. Work at one point at a time. And you notice the sleeve is now moving exactly with the skin because of that expression. So no matter what I do moving forward, the sleeve is going to stay with the skin and any duplicates of the sleeve will have that expression added to them already. I only had to add it at the start. I'm going to duplicate the sleeve and fix that shoulder now. So I've got the sleeve selected in my contents, control D. Hit enter to name it. I'll call it shoulder. This is already has the expression because the sleeve had the expression. So now I'm going to fix that stroke. I'm going to give it a round cap and a round join. And that's too much there. So I'm going to shorten that. The trim path is already added from the previous one. You can see if I go here. If I go too far, you start seeing the shoulder skin. So I want it to be just far enough that it covers up that shoulder. So now we've got a perfect shoulder and the squared off sleeve the way it would be in real life. I'm going to duplicate the sleeve now. I've got the sleeve selected in my contents of the arm. I'm going to hit Command D or Control D. Hit Enter to name it and I'll call this Stripes to add a little interest to our character. I'm going to twirl down, go to my stroke, click the plus to create the stripes. I'm not going to do the miter limit there. Okay, now we're not seeing them because I haven't changed the color. Let's pick a color for the stripes. Let's do red stripes. Why not? Now we can see our stripes. And now we're seeing the shoulder a bit more as well. So let's try and put the stripes above the shoulder. And we still have that rounded shoulder join. And the stripes are now animating with the arm as it moves and everything else stays in its position. That arm is now done. Let's see what it looks like if we put it below the torso. And it covers up that little bit that was hanging over. 
So this arm's all done. If I duplicate it, Command D, hit Enter to name it, call it Arm Right, and slide it over. And I could put this one above the torso if I wanted. And I could have I could have both arms moving the same way if I wanted. Or I could hit the U and give this its own life. So I could grab this point. I'm holding down shift to get just those single points. There we go. That's better. Now this arm still has the expression on it that we copied from the other one. See? And then I could move those up together to get that third keyframe. Like such. So I just changed my path points to have the arm facing in the correct direction, and I could put it below the torso if I wanted as well. I just got to watch right here where it passes over the body. That looks a little weird. Or it could just be going behind the back. It's your call as a designer. I'm going to select both my arms, Control D or Command D, put them below the hips, and I'm going to hit Enter to name it. And I'll call this leg, right? And I'll call this one, hit enter, I'll call it leg left. So I've got them selected. I hit P, move them down, and I can use these to work off of my legs. All I do is I hit U to bring up my keyframes. Get rid of all the extra keyframes that I didn't want and make them more leg like. We zoom in a little bit. Here we go. And I'm also going to make them look more like pants as well. This will be the knee, and this will become the calf. Same thing, that'll be the knee. This will become the calf. I can even move them wherever I want using the position. Let's move them up a little bit. Okay, fine. All right, now, now let's take a look at both of the Sorry about that. I've got my interns writing me. I have a multi-person video shoot I'm directing tomorrow, so. All right. Now, let's go back to our contents, because that's where everything's at. Stripes. We can hide this by clicking the eyeball. And let's go to the sleeve, and we'll change the color. Let's just say the person's wearing brown pants. Why not? Good, and we can do the shoulder, make that the same color as the brown pants. Perfect. And then we just go to the sleeve, which is now the pants, and we adjust the trim path so it's longer, or they could be shorts, whichever you want, but my person's going to wear pants. And I just do the same thing for the other one. which I'm not going to do because you already saw me do it once. All right, arm, arm right will get parented to the torso. Arm left will get parented to the torso. Leg right will get parented to the hips. Leg left will get parented to the hips. So the only thing that's not parented is the torso. That's what's driving our character. Let's test it out. Perfect. If I move the torso, the whole character moves. If I hit rotate, Whole character moves and we still keep our keyframe motion 
while keeping the character together. Excellent. Two more things to show, and then we're done the lecture. So here's our full character. Here's the walkthrough on arms. And there's the cat's eye where we talked about texturing and gradients. All this is simple shapes, but to see how much more interest this has, as opposed to that, because I put more attention into this. But again, they're all just shapes. It's what you do with them and how you dress them up that's going to set you apart, not only as a designer, but a motion designer as well. All right, now I'm going to do hand and fingers. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to start by making a hand shape, uh, and this will be a fill. Hit OK. I'll get rid of the stroke. And color. Let's make our character green. Why not? All right. Here we go. I'm just going to make a rough hand shape. The most important thing is I'm going to want almost a circular join here to hide any um, overlaps while it's rotating off of the wrist. So that's the main thing here to take away from this. All right, I'm going to have to scale this down because it's too big. So I'm going to hit S for scale. Scale down. There we go. Great. Hit enter to name it. All right. I'm going to put a solid layer behind this just so we can see our strokes. Uh, let's do light blue. Sure. All right. Here's our hand. I'm going to move it up a little bit. I'm going to do no fill and a stroke for all the fingers. And obviously they're going to be the same color as the hand. So nothing selected. Two points is all I need with a Bezier curve. Right, I'll make this the thickness I want for the finger. Twirl it down. Contents, shape, stroke. We're going to give it a round cap and a round join. And already we've got a cartoony looking finger. I'm going to twirl down the path. First, I'm going to call this shape. Let me test this out here. I'll call this skin. All right, now here's where we'll get a little experimental here. It should get interesting. I'm going to click the stopwatch here. I'm going to duplicate the skin. Control D and I'll call this stroke. You'll see in a second why. All right, now I'm going to turn off the stopwatch. And I'm going to hold down Alt or Option while I click it. There's my expression field. Here's my pick whip by the expression. I parented it to the skin. There's the white arrow. I'm not in the expression. I click out of it. That part's done. So now let's change the fill color. And we'll do black for our stroke. And oh, that's the fill. Sorry about that. Here's the stroke. Okay, great. And let's make it a little bit wider than the main finger. And let's try and put the skin over top of it. Okay, good. We're still going good here. Let's move the skin and test it out. One second. Okay, great. It works. Perfect. We're on track here. All right. 
There's our skin. There's our stroke. Now, here's where we get into shape layers a little bit more. We don't want the stroke all the way around the finger. It's going to look weird when it meets up with the hand. And the hand is going to get a stroke around it too. So if I go hand, contents, let me twirl this down. I'll call this skin. Duplicate it, Command D. We're not animating the hand, the palm. That would be the stroke. Let me put below. Okay, great. Now for this, I just change the color. And you know what? I've got to add a stroke. That's why it's didn't have a stroke, it only had a fill. There we go. Okay. And I don't know what number uh, stroke the other one is. I'm just eyeballing it. That looks pretty on. Okay. So we're done with the hand. And we'll do the same thing for where it meets the uh, wrist as well when we're done with this for a second. So the index finger, I'm going to get rid of that stroke going all the way around by adding a trim path. Now, let's see how this is going to go. Is it the start or the end? Okay, there's that. It's doing both of them. That's weird. All right, let me delete that. Here's the stroke. Oh, I had the finger selected. So if I go to the stroke with just the stroke selected, let's see if we can do it here. Perfect. Now it's only affecting that. So just that little bit. And if you need to, you can adjust the offset. Shorten it some more so you can see it better. See? Like that. But I got in pretty lucky right there. And that's looking all right. Like such. Any questions on that? All right. So you know the name of the game. Command D. I've already got my shape. I've already got my parenting and it works. Command D. P to position it. Also remember uh, the Middle finger is longer, so I'm going to go to my contents, find my skin again, go to the path, for that keyframe. Now I can hold down shift to get just that one. There we go. That's good. That's done. We'll duplicate the index finger again because that's roughly the same size as the ring finger. Hit P for position, move it over. And you can even look at your own hand. My ring finger is roughly the same size as my index finger. So, and then the pinky would be shortest. You do something else for the thumb, but it's going to follow the same format. So let's, as we said, add a wrist. We'll pretend this is the wrist right here. Fill. Okay, there's the stroke. And. Oh, wait, that went to the ring finger because it was still selected. Sorry about that. Okay, nothing selected. There's a wrist. It's not perfect, but it doesn't need to be for this demonstration. Put the hand above the wrist. And now we'll fix that stroke. So here's our stroke. With that selected, I'm going to go to add. Remember, you got to have the shape tools or your selection tool. There's a stroke. We're going to add a trim path to it. 
Now we just find out which way it is. There it is. It's right there. So now I can adjust this stroke, make it a little more like the other one. And there we go. A hand with a stroke that moves together with the fill. Any questions on that? No? Okay. I'm going to hit save. And if you wanted to, you could say the hand is parented to the wrist and the fingers are parented to the hand. Like such. It's not just animating your paths, it's parenting everything. So if I put that up there, my anchor point. Now if I rotate my wrist, hand goes with it. Boom. Quick and easy. So just in this 50 minutes, we did a lot of texturing, shape path, talking about rigging, doing complex look at shape layers, as well as doing hand. Like such. Got one more thing and then we're done. Hooray. All right. An arm with, so we're going to do an arm with creases. All right, I'm going to get this no fill. There's a stroke. You know what? Actually, no, we're getting rid of that. Uh-uh. You're doing something new now. So that's how we roll. Okay. I'm going to use the oval tool for this, uh, the rounded rectangle, actually. Because you don't always have to use the path if you don't want to draw. And plus, this is a little bit faster. All right. I'm going to put my anchor point up here where it meets the shoulder. And I'm going to get rid of the stroke. All right, so I'm going to call the shoulder. All right, zoom out a little bit. Hit Command D to duplicate it. Move it. Actually, I'll move it. I'm going to move it straight down so it lines up. And I'll call this uh, forearm. And I'm going to rotate it a little bit. OK, perfect. I'm not doing the hand, any of that stuff. Uh, but I am going to copy my background. All right. So here's getting an arm with a crease. I'm going to parent the forearm to the shoulder. So if I rotate the shoulder, the forearm goes with it. Hooray, we're done there. Now, for each of these, I'm going to try, see, here's, here's talking through it. If I put a trim path on this and I want to have the stroke not go all the way around, that's also going to affect the fill. Okay, that's why I'm doing two of these. So here's my shoulder. I'm going to twirl it down, go to contents. I'm going to call this fill and I'm going to do the same for my forearm. Okay, so I've got a fill for each one and I'm happy. So next I'm going to duplicate it, command D. And I'm going to duplicate it there. And I'll name each one stroke. All right. Now for the stroke, I'm going to add a stroke because it only has a fill. There's the stroke. Great. And for the stroke, I'm going to add a stroke. Okay. Now for each one, I'm just going to 
use this that we've got here. So I did 19. I'll do 19 here. Any questions on where we're at so far? Okay. So I'm going to want to add a little bit of a trim path to the stroke on the forearm to make it look like there's a crease when the arm moves. So I've got my forearm selected and the stroke layer. So I'm going to go to trim paths. So now when I rotate it, I've got that crease. That's how you get a crease for your elbow bends as well as your pant legs when the knee is moving and you got your calf moving. It's done the same for each. And the shoulder, if same thing, if you want that stroke to have a little bit of a gap where it meets the body, I go to my stroke, add, trim pads, twirl down, and it's either the start or the end, and you just get it whatever length you want. And if you need to, to adjust the offset to get the angle you want. Just like that. All right. Great. Uh, any questions? Okay. Oh, and no one called me out on this. The main point of the lecture. Oh, we already parented it. Okay. Yeah, forearms parented to the shoulder. Perfect. All right. So I'll email that out once we're all done. All right. Uh, anyone have anything to show me for lab time tonight? We'll wrap it up at like 745 since no one's got anything. Now, this is important. I was doing a vertical monitor, so I'm going to switch back to horizontal. And let's do 10 seconds. That way I'll save myself some time next time I'm in After Effects again. Hmm. Oh, you know what? I know exactly what I'm going to do. I don't know if I've done this yet, but it's as good a time as any to bring it up. Okay, fine. Let's check out our motion. All right, we got some motion. Oh man, that is slow, but let's speed it up. If I hold down Alt, it's gonna keep those last ones. There we go. Now let's take a look. Okay, that's better. Let me grab the first starting frame. Put it there so it starts and ends on the same spot. Okay, so you have to have alpha. You have to have motion for this to work. Echo. So it might even work with the video clip, but you have to have alpha. So it'd have to be like green screened out. So move forward a little bit and you can already see what's happening. You could have it fade in. Or you could have it fade out over time. Like that. You can choose your blending mode. Make it a longer trail. We could also change the timing of it if you're careful with it. So that's the same number it was by the default. And let's see if rotation 
works for this as well. Okay, so the whole layer rotated, but it is echoing the rotation, okay? Scale down so we can see it a bit better. Let's see if I can move the anchor point to the center of the star without messing everything up. Nope. That ain't gonna work. Now I wonder what would happen if we animated the color with the echoes. Hmm. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. Now we answered that one. Let's see what happens if I duplicate this. Slide it a frame or two. And I change the blending mode. <laughs> 